Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Today we have a special guest today, Miguel Santiago, joining us from Assembly District 53. Miguel, welcome to the studio. Thanks for joining us. How's it going? Pretty good. It's hot out there and it's going to get a lot hotter. <laughs> it is. It's heating up and that means that, you know, you guys are about to finish up here, go through a probes and go home. Kind of, can you kind of bring us into kind of what you've been working on, I guess, these past, I guess, what? What is it? What, May? We're in five months now. Wow, already, huh? Yeah, it's it's gone by fast. Kind of. I guess we just got out of committee season. Kind of. How have you been doing so far on your bills? Well, we're doing pretty good. I mean, look, the the legislature is humming and it's working as hard as it possibly can under the constraints of COVID. So we're doing everything we possibly can to keep everybody safe, social mm -hmm. distancing, working uh, with our masks on on the floor, uh, making sure that everybody's getting vaccinated. But the number one priority for everyone is is the reopening and the recovery, and right. central to that is getting everybody vaccinated. Uh, it's the way not to spread it. So right. for everybody listening out there, if you haven't already got your one vaccine, it takes two, <laughs> depending on which one you're taking. Exactly. It takes two. You know, it's it's so interesting. You know, today is like the tremendous day where, you know, LA County moves to yellow zone yeah. and life is getting back to normal there. The rest of the state is is playing catch up. Uh, I know you're from LA. Can you, I guess, kind of tell us a little bit about your district and why is LA doing so well when the rest of us are lagging behind here? Well, first of all, most, most people are asking, what the heck's going on with all these colors, right? right. <laughs> but basically what it means is uh, we are now on a path towards recovery mm -hmm. because uh, there's enough vaccinated people, uh, people who unfortunately had COVID, uh, that we're now seeing less transmission and uh, mortality rates. Okay. In, in fact, uh, it was a day or two ago where we, we had zero mortality rates, uh, and that's a, a big milestone. Uh, but key to that is just making sure that people get uh, their vaccines uh, or get two vaccines because- we're not going to be able to combat this if if folks are not vaccinated. Right. And that is key to this. And I'm going to keep pressing on that. So whoever's listening, uh, you got to get vaccinated. Uh, but the things that we're working on uh, besides vaccination is making sure that folks who are most vulnerable, uh, who are most in need, um, have the tools and the resources. That's why we, as a legislature myself, uh, strongly advocated uh, for an eviction moratorium and mm -hmm. the resources to be able to pay for rent. Uh, because nothing could be worse than coming out of a pandemic not having a job uh, for a significant amount of time, uh, piled up debt, and then ending up homeless on the street. And then right. that leads us to the issue of homelessness. I mean, currently we're advocating uh, for $20 billion over the next five years uh, to tackle this issue of homelessness. It is the existential crisis of our lifetime. Right. The fact that you could walk out into almost any community and have people who are homeless. Uh, along with that is food insecurity. We've got to make sure uh, that folks are able to feed the themselves and their kids. And right now we're seeing uh, generations of kids who are going to sleep uh, without any food and they're hungry and they're hungry in the morning. And this is the fifth largest economy in the world. Uh, we're in a in one, of, in one of the richest countries uh, in on the planet and kids go to sleep hungry. Right. You know, so those are the things we're tackling. And then, of course, we got to figure this EDD thing out because it's, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we've in our in our um office we get hundreds of calls a day and people have a right to be upset look i'm upset still I mean, even even a you know a year later here we are it's well, still happening huh? i'm still pissed and people are still pissed because <laughs> they're not getting a result right you know right now we have about close to a, th a thousand cases in my office and we're consistently banging on the on edd consistently calling helping our um our constituents but uh my experience is not unique mm. you ask any of our colleagues they have one job they give the unemployment EDD. benefit and they failed wow <laughs> So yeah, there's a lot on our plate. Unbelievable. Just to give, I guess, the listeners who don't know uh, a little background on you, kind of, can you tell us a little bit about your district and kind of your journey sure. here? Absolutely. Uh, well, my journey started off with a plane flight up here. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh, well, before I came up here, I served on the um, LA Community College right. Board. Uh, but there's a, there's a long history before that. And, and I really think uh, when I explain, you know, what the journey is, I won't take you through the hours long uh, mm -hmm. version of what, uh, of my family, but I'll take you through the short version. Right. So my, my journey started um, with my parents coming to the U.S. Uh, to give us a better tomorrow. So uh, it explains, too, why I work on a lot of those uh, issues as mm -hmm. it relates to immigrants, because they came here literally with just maybe a backpack and shoes and very little in their, in their pockets. Uh, and this is where they started uh, their family, their life. Right. And I was fortunate enough to be born here along with my brother. And uh, we we started uh, humbly, right? Like most people do. My dad was a day laborer, undocumented. Uh, but it really does prove that California and the U.S. does give people that opportunity. And that's what we fight here for, is to give people uh, that opportunity. Or otherwise, we'd be wasting right. our time. Amazing. So so 8053, what is that? That's downtown L.A. and kind of surrounding areas? Can you 
tell us yeah, a little bit yeah. about kind of the, the areas you represent? Yeah. So for everybody listening in 1853, best district in the state of California, <laughs> hands down, big round of applause for everybody out there. But what that encompasses is a city of Hunton Park, uh, Ball Heights, downtown Los Angeles, uh-huh. Little Tokyo, Pico Union MacArthur Park, uh, and Koreatown. Those are the basic big chunks uh, of the district. Staple Center. Staple the, Center. Absolutely. So NBA championships yeah. are happening no Lakers. in your district. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's also... Um, it's also got uh, some of the uh, poorest areas uh, in the state. So we often are about the second poorest district in the state of California. In 2018, we had over 150,000 people who lived at the federal poverty line. That means uh, four earning uh, 25,000 and below. Mm. Uh, so the numbers don't get much better when you go to 250. Uh, a thousand people in the district. So it's a humble district. And it's one of the richest uh, in cultural diversity as well, uh, because you have a strong Central American uh, community presence in Pico Union MacArthur Park. You have Southern portions of uh, of uh, Latin America that are represented within those areas in recent mm-hmm. um, immigration patterns. You have uh, Koreatown, which shouldn't surprise you, uh, second uh, strongest Korean presence outside of, uh, of Seoul, uh, Korea. Uh, and then you have uh, south um, east communities within that area as well. Uh, pockets of African American on the b- bottom portion of right. Koreatown. But we also have downtown Los Angeles, and that's usually what people look at and think, wow, what a rich area. But mm. um, uh, but we have a booming downtown Los Angeles uh, spare during the COVID season. Uh, but we've also have uh, Skid Row, uh, which is historically uh, that community where you've had failed policies on homelessness dating back to uh, mid-century last, and even policies of containment that created what we know now as Skid Row, uh, Mexican-American community on Bull Heights, uh, heavy industry in Vernon, where you have 50 to 55,000 yeah, cars that drive right. in every single day at, 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 in and out, and less uh, about 100 and something residents who actually live there, and, and then uh, Hunton Park. So it's, and I mentioned Little Tokyo as well, where you have a strong uh, Japanese-American community. Lots happening. I call it the epicenter of activism, uh, community strength. Right. It's, it's, it's an awesome it's district. I love yeah. it. It has a little bit of everything in, in policy everything. we deal with. Uh, I guess you get to be in the center of all of it. Uh, you know, homelessness is something you've talked about, you know, Skid Row. Uh, you know, I guess, how, how is homelessness being worked on? Uh, I guess in the past, you're saying there's years and years of failed policy. Kind of what are you working on now to kind of address the homelessness and kind of hopefully, you know, bring these people out of homelessness? Yeah. You know, it's one of those things where um, after years of working on the bol- policy pieces and the budget pieces, mm. y- you find yourself every single year um, injecting that sense of urgency into the situation. This year, uh, we're coming back and we're saying uh, $20 billion over the next five years uh, is the adequate number to even begin to tackle it. Because in the past, wow. although we fought extremely hard for homeless dollars, mm. uh, oftentimes, you know, we use this term budget dust. But when you really think about the amounts that we've invested on the most important, one of the most important issues of our lifetime, you know, if we really want to solve this issue, we really got to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, and look, I'll, I'll honestly tell you that we have to radically change uh, the way uh, we solve homelessness in the business of solving homelessness. Uh, and by business, I don't mean profits. I mean in, in the in, in the endeavors and policy discussions. Mm-hmm. Uh, there has to be inserted ironclad accountability and an emergency sense-like urgency that just stems and screams that we've got to do it today. We don't have a year. We don't have six months. We don't have a decade to plan this thing out. People are literally dying on the streets. And and quite frankly, you know, we spent a lot of time last year uh, talking about racial equity. We spent a right. lot of time talking about Black Lives Matter, uh, stop AAPI hate, support uh, undocumented immigrants, fight against the Muslim. We spent a lot of time talking about equity issues, LGBTQ rights. But when you when when you talk about those issues, you have to acknowledge that large proportions of people who are living on the street are people of color. And it should not surprise anybody that they have been left behind. And so smack in the center of this racial equity conversation has to be housing our unhoused community. I mean, plain and simple. I don't know what, any other way to say it other than than, it, than if you joined the marches last year, if you joined the policy conversations, if you've ignited that passion to want to change something, then central to that has to be uh, demanding uh, that we take care of this homelessness issue because I'm not satisfied with it. And I've been working on this issue, right. uh, but you know, and I'm drumming up the beats and 
you know, pretty soon you might hear about March we're doing and, you know, demanding, uh, demanding on uh, solving this issue. Uh, we've done CEQA exemptions for permit supportive housing and emergency shelters in Los Angeles. Uh, we've delivered dollars across uh, the region and the entire state. We've engaged in difficult conversations about conservatorship. Uh, and so we're doing it all. But look, at the end of the day, I, I, I think there needs to be, like I said, that radical change uh, to solving homelessness, ironclad accountability, and an emergency sense-like sense -like actions uh, that propel us to do it today, not tomorrow. Yeah. You know, it, it seems kind of odd, but, you know, a lot of people attribute the homelessness starting kind of back in 2007 during the last recession. But there seems to be really a, an increase in the homeless population in the last two to three years. Kind of what, in, in your experience and your knowledge of, of dealing with homelessness here in California, what do you attribute kind of the, the rise in homelessness to be uh, of late? Well, it's not just one thing alone, but I think we can, we can if we're going to argue that it's one thing, then it's failed systems, policies, and institutions that have allowed this to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you start breaking that apart i mean uh, high rents plain and simple can't afford the rent where are you gonna go right lack of affordable housing um uh, it, it's a mental health care crisis that has not been solved with, with an adequate investment it's the lack of investment in substance abuse it's the pr prison pipeline to the streets uh it's the foster care system um, it's a number of things. Those those mm -hmm. are just a few. I'm not going to suggest that those are the only ones. Right. So if you're listening to me talk, yes, there's about another two dozen reasons. But I wanted to start off with those just to say how complex the issue is. Because even when you take a look at our uh, foster care system, uh, somebody at the age of 18 isn't any better than they were at 17 and a half in, in regards to being able to afford an apartment, in regards to being able to have a full-time job that does that. And yet we don't have a plan uh, for somebody who gets released. Uh, be because of overcriminalization policies uh, uh, of the past, and you spend a little bit of time uh, in jail, a county jail, or in prison, and you get released, you have nowhere to go. Right. There isn't that that sort of rehabilitative or pathway towards success. Uh, if the rents are too high, which is why we fight extremely hard for the eviction moratoriums as well as uh, the money for uh, rental assistance, uh, if the rent's too high, where do you go? Yeah, I, I, we see right. now generations of kids who are living uh, on the streets or in cars. And, and this is not unique to my community, but this is happening all across the state of California. Uh, if there's not affordable housing, what do you do? Uh, if we don't have the adequate jobs. We just went through in California uh, the fight for 15, uh, even though there was naysayers out there about the fight for 15. But I was told everybody who wasn't sold on the idea, okay, you make 15 and tell me that's enough. Right. <laughs> you know, oh, no, well, you know, or people who say there's enough social programs, we call BS on that. Mm -hmm. It's just not working and, and there's not enough. No, unbelievable. Uh, it's month of May here. May revise coming up. Uh, a lot of budget work coming up here in the next few weeks. Kind of, can you, you? You already mentioned a few of them. Can you kind of, I guess, delve into kind of some of the budget priorities you're looking for sure. to, to help your constituents out? Absolutely. Well, Senator, uh, the mission that we're trying to fight for here is attacking this issue of income inequality. Mm -hmm. And key to this has got to be uh, money for rental assistance, uh, which we at the beginning of the year uh, or end of last year called for five billion. Uh, we're on our way there. Uh, now we're calling for uh, 20 billion uh, over the next five years for homelessness, uh, but also uh, food assistance. Uh, what we learned during the pandemic, uh, and we saw food lines and food banks go from 25, 50 people to thousands of people uh, all over the state of California. And it shouldn't surprise us that those lines are not going to go down because frontline essential workers, in many cases, put their life on the line. If you are fortunate still to have a job, if you are fortunate to work from home, then you might have done okay. And the LAO reports demonstrate that those uh, and those earning categories did better. Right. Um, but if you uh, were at the lowest economic uh, earners, you were devastated. All the fast food places were closed. Uh, large venues uh, were closed. Janitorial services. Uh, all those lowest wage earned earner jobs uh, disappeared. Right. And, and for almost over a year now. So those people, uh, like the ones I represent in my community, are devastated. And uh, we're starting off with a very basic, keep a, sh a shelter uh, over their head and feed the kids. There are generations of kids in that, and it's all over California who go to sleep hungry and wake up hungry. Right. You know, one thing you've kind of talked about a few times is the eviction moratorium. Uh, what is that set to it currently expire this July? Uh, January 30th is when it expires. So okay. yes. Uh, of, it, of 22. We, of 
21 we're in year 21 it's okay. amazing to think we're still at 21 right because okay. so much has happened okay. 21 yeah. it usually happens 19 20 21 right. 22 so right. we're in 21 we're in 21 okay we are in 20 so the uh, eviction moratorium expires uh june 30th june 30th okay so so it, we are with that one uh july 1st but we still have time uh mm -hmm. now between now and then uh both to, for the in the, for the state to roll up their sleeves and for the feds to also step in so are, are you saying when, when you when you say that are you, are you envisioning sort of some sort of extension of that moratorium or some sort of I guess payment assistance? That's something you've, you've said as well. Well, payment assistance exists right now mm -hmm. at, uh, through SB ninety one, uh, which did uh, two things: it, it, it allowed for the statewide program and allowed also investment and local municipalities to uh, to do that. Like in the city of Los Angeles, where I live, um, there was an investment uh, of about close to, if I'm not mistaken, about eight. Uh, close to about 120 million from the feds directly. Uh, we did about a little over about close to about 130 million. So I'm rounding off numbers. So right. the number is close to about 250 million uh, for the city of Los Angeles, who just cut their application off uh, April 30th uh, to do uh, that sort of assistance. Mm -hmm. And those are for the lowest income earners, uh, meaning 50% AMI and below, which is about 56,000 for a family right. of four or 30% AMI and below. Now, those areas not within the city of Los Angeles or those pro or those municipalities that did their own programming can still apply under housing is key. Um, like uh, neighborhoods that I represent, like the city of Huntington Park, uh, outside of the city of Los Angeles, but still within the LA County area, they can go through housing is key uh, to submit an application. A little bit different in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, who they're going to serve, still 80% AMI and below uh, priority okay. uh, with the ability to do utilities. City of Los Angeles has its own utility, so they're not doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I know another issue that you're you're passionate about and kind of delves into what we're talking about is, is human trafficking. Can you kind of talk about, you know, I know in the past you've gotten some budget funding for human trafficking, kind of what you're working on this year and kind of, you know, I guess how has human trafficking occurred, you know, during the pandemic and, you know, is has there been an increase in human trafficking that you've seen? Yeah. Um, I don't know how else to say it, but I can't even, I can't, uh, probably one of the most horrific crimes that could exist to any human being, to steal them um, and use them to create profit. Yeah. I mean, that's plain and simple language. Uh, people are stolen. Uh, they're beaten, abused, held against their will, drugged. Uh, oftentimes uh, for work, um, but most of the time uh, for sex. Um, children, boys, girls, uh, grown adults, uh, and it happens um, all across America and here particularly uh, in California and particularly in the areas that I represent or dense urban areas mm -hmm. uh, from the poorest neighborhoods to the richest neighborhoods. And um, what we're asking for and is an additional 10 million. So there is a 10 million currently in the budget. And those are to help uh, those who are trying to escape. And that means rental assistance, food assistance. It could include legal advice. And there are organizations up and down the state who do this. Now, this is a budget, uh, the 10 million that was already included, and we fought hard to get that there. But what we're now asking because of the pandemic, is an additional uh, 10 million because if people had to shelter at home, could you imagine what happened uh, to folks who are human trafficked and had to shelter uh, with their abusers or and, and those who uh, held them against their will? Wow, yeah. And that's what we're really facing. So we, we, we have more of a desperate need uh, to help them escape the conditions that they're in. Um, there are uh, young mothers who are held captive with their kids. I mean, it's, it's plain and simple. We see this all the time. Uh, there are folks who have no escape from the torment they face, and even under COVID. Um, so that's what we're asking for, an additional uh, $10 million. So when you really look at it, uh, we, our budget typically goes well over $230 billion uh, in recent history, yeah, wow. it's just budget dust. <laughs> We're asking for budget dust million. for one of the most horrific uh, humanitarian crimes that could ever exist on planet Earth. Right.
You know, I, I know, you know, this has been talked about and it just seems like such an unfathomable crime that it, you know, this is allowed to occur. Um, well, it's not allowed. But, right. But it occurs. Exactly. It occurs. People are stolen from across uh, the world. People are stolen uh, uh, in their own um, in their own cities, uh, driven from one side of the country to the other. Uh, and I use a strong word like stolen, but let, let, let's not um, sugarcoat what it is. Mm-hmm. When somebody is taken against their own will or misled to believe that they were doing something else and then held against their own will to do something, let's be very clear about what that is. You are taking a human being and you're forcing them to do things that are unimaginable, unimaginable to the mind, right? simply because someone wants to make a profit. No, no, it's totally outrageous. Um, I guess within the, the 10 million that you've gotten the past few years, kind of what are some of the the positives that's come out of that? And kind of what do you expect with an additional 10 for the 20 sure. to hope to achieve? Well, when somebody cries out for help and they want to leave that situation, we got to help with rental assistance. Mm-hmm. We've got to help with putting their life back together. We've got to help with making sure that they have a safe place where they can't be found. Uh, job skills. Uh, helping them to find a job, uh, helping them to take care of those immediate needs that anybody needs when they're getting, uh, when they're getting them off the floor, so to speak. Um, so what's key to this is making sure that we have the resources, and, and we know that that COVID has made the situation much worse. Right. We don't know how bad it is, but we know that it has gotten a lot worse. So we want to make sure that we have the adequate resources so that. Uh, when you call an organization that does this, and I work very closely uh, with CAST that's in Los Angeles, uh, that when they call, that resource is there, that we can get them into an apartment, that we can get them into a hotel room, uh, that we can get them uh, fed, clothed, uh, and the training necessary to be able to get out of job, that we have the wraparound support services, Mm -hmm. that we have uh, the mentoring, that we have uh, the mental health care services or, or the therapies, um, whatever it is that that individual needs at the at that moment, and we want to meet them at that moment, we need to have the resources to do that. Right, and that's really what we're fighting for. You know, uh, you know, so much has has been looked at, you know, over the past few you know years about um, incarcerations and, and crime and punishment, um, but this has obviously been an area that you know could I guess use more uh, in resources for local law enforcement. What's what's being done on the the law enforcement side to help kind of eradicate? human trafficking. Well, the laws are already in the book. You can't do this to somebody, mm-hmm. you know, and, and there's already efforts there to do it. One of the big challenges is if, and we faced this through legislative conversations years ago when I carried a bill to uh, decrease the age, uh, sorry, increase the age of those who could do uh, testifying video, um, video camera closed circuit away from the uh, courtroom. And this was really key because if you're a young person and you've now escaped this tragic situation, right. we can't expect you, sh- nor should we, to go into the court, face your accuser with all the trauma that it comes with, and what if the case doesn't hold? And that young person has nowhere to go right. after that. Uh, so there are. So we've worked on that. Um, certainly law enforcement works on that issue. And, and in fact, recently I had a conversation with the uh, incoming AG uh, Mr. Bonta, you know, and, and we talked about this, right? right? And he, he wants to get engaged, wants to work on this. And, and just for all the uh, listeners here, uh, we have a little running joke that I tell him all the time. We, we call him Bonta Mania. So if you happen to see him, <laughs> AG Bonta Mania. But, um, but in, in all seriousness, um, I think it's an area that we need to create awareness uh, so that folks understand what really does happen and the amount of resources and what we need to do. Uh, and to look for the signs too. Right. Well, uh, look for the signs of somebody who needs that help and to be able to give them the resources. And that's why I, I, I'm going to circle back into the dollars that we're requesting, because if we come across somebody uh, and we know that this is the case or that they are asking for help, we need to give them the ability to contact somebody. But we, uh, but we need to have the resources there when they call. Right. And, and this is absolutely critical. Yeah. I, I guess. Could you delve into that a little more about kind of the groups you work with, kind of what what they're working on? And if if listeners out there. I guess see something or know something. Who sure. who, who could they contact? Well, to I'm help? an LA guy, so I'm gonna I'm gonna plug in Cast. Right. <laughs> but that's an organization that we work with, uh, and you can easily Google it, Cast. Uh, and if uh, 
you do come across somebody and it's, you know, sometimes it's who you might expect or who you might not expect. Just giving them that, that, that telephone number uh, goes a long ways. Or if you suspect, maybe calling CAST and asking for the best practices as to how to talk to that individual or, or maybe identify that individual. Mm-hmm. But what's key to it is, is not ignoring it, you know, not ignoring it uh, and creating awareness. It's not the kind of conversation most people have. Uh, it's not something that is uh, on the uh, front of the newspaper or uh, in the news every single night. Right. Uh, but it's something that is devastating. And it's kind of like what we're doing right here. I mean, most people probably uh, are new to the subject, mm-hmm. uh, haven't uh, dove into it uh, as deeply. But when you listen to it, now you know. And now there is a responsibility. So lots of things people can do uh, to it. Um, mostly be aware, understand, don't tolerate it. Uh, and look up a nonprofit in the area who may be doing work on it. If somebody asks for help or you think uh, that somebody is uh, being held against their will, uh, make that call. And that's key. Make that call. Yeah. Um, with the additional $10 million, what what can these organizations expect to do to kind of increase their efforts here? Well, mo- most, of it, most of it has to do with giving the services, and that's mm. what's key. And I know I keep going back to that, but right. that really is key. When somebody calls, we don't want to turn them away because there aren't the services. When somebody calls and says, I need help, on the other side of that line should be, what can we help you with immediately? I need, uh, you know, I need a place to stay. Mm. We need to figure out right away the fastest way to get them somewhere to stay. And typically that might be uh, temporary housing in, in the way of a, of a hotel. Uh, but we need to get them away from the situation they are at uh, until we find a more permanent solution like an apartment. Uh, and uh, But that's where we ultimately want them is to, help reconstruct their lives. Right. Um, but we need to get them out of there. And that's why these dollars are incredibly important. And, and some of it is also trying to reconnect with family, but we're going to need the resources to reconnect with family uh, or we're going to need the resources uh, for or any sort of um, any sort of services that they might request or need immediately. Uh, basic food stuff. Uh, and these are all critical. I know I, I go back to the basics because really that is what it takes when somebody needs to to walk away from that situation. Uh, there's counseling involved, there's rental assistance. Uh, there's a lot that needs to happen um, with a lot of tender love and care uh, with somebody who's gone through a, a, a traumatic experience like this. Right. Just simple basics, you know, food, shelter. That's what you want to start off right? with. Yeah. I mean, because the number one thing is if somebody calls and says, I need help and I need to get out of here, this situation, the response should be if we get these dollars, because the, the, the need has increased is, Yes, and here's where we're going to put you up. Right. That's why it's so key. First thing is to, to get that person in a safe location. Mm. No, totally. Well, thank you so much for your leadership and, and dialing into that. It's incredible work you're doing on that topic. And well, thank you. Thank best you of luck asking. for you on the on the budget. Uh, just delve into, I guess, to a little a uh, couple of your other bills. Kind of what what are some of your other bills that are either in a probes or are headed over to the Senate right now that you that you're excited about? Well, we're excited to to um, wish for the best. That they're all going to get out of appropriations, the governor's <laughs> death. So here we come, Gov. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, a bank hell I'm really excited about. It's a uh, public banking option. And what that does, uh, much like uh, or somewhat similar to Cal Savers or Kid Saves, uh, which, is, um, which gives the ability uh, for low-income communities to bank with zero fees, uh, zero charges, zero penalties, uh, and simply uh, not get charged or nickel and dimed over and over and over by right. financial institutions. And this is key because, look, here's the difference. When a rich person makes money, that money makes money. Mm-hmm. When a poor person make mo- makes money, that money is gouged over and over and over and over. Whether it's payday lending, whether it's the local liquor store who who cashes a check but takes uh, a cut, whether it's you know, whatever financial right. institution you go to, whether it's a bank you give an overdraft uh, fee, you know, it's 35 bucks to 50 bucks for an overdraft fee. I mean, Look, just don't send the money. There's no overdraft fee, right? I mean, but we charge an overdraft fee. Right. Um, so what we're after is for those who are unbanked or underbanked to have the ability uh, to go to a bank. We're calling it uh, Bank Cal uh, and get all those services uh, for free. We know that in our communities, oftentimes uh, undocumented immigrants, uh, many of the times uh, low wage uh, income earners, 15 mm-hmm. bucks uh, and below. Uh, or around that area, uh, those are the ones who we're really targeting to get banked. And this leads to buildings, uh, building wealth, 
Uh, and by I'm not talking about, you know, Bessel's kind of wealth, but I'm talking about the ability to save, the ability to build credit, the ability to right. get a car instead of going to the corner where somebody gouges a 23, 25% uh, for that used car. We want them to go to a dealership. We want them to eventually buy a home. We want them to have credit to build their lives uh, and, and to look forward to a better tomorrow. So I really feel very, very passionate yeah, uh, yeah. about that bill. No, that makes sense because they, they even just charge you just to have a bank account, right? If yeah. you're below a minimum amount and usually Which like makes 10, no sense. 10,000 bucks or something no like that, you're going to charge sense. you like, I mean, 30 bucks a month or something like that. And overdraft fees. Right. I mean, have you ever wondered, like, do you really need to transfer the money? And then charge me thirty five to fifty bucks. Yeah. Just don't transfer the money. <laughs> or the the ATM withdraw fees, and you know people are like, well, if I have to withdraw, you know, twenty bucks, I might as you know they're going to charge me two or three dollars. I might as well withdraw but as much as I can, right? But could you imagine if you're if you're making fifteen bucks an hour, and every you know you have to keep over a hundred bucks in the account? Yeah. I mean, I think about when I was- I remember, uh, yeah, when I was younger, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah when I was a kid, you know, my, my parents, I mean, they didn't have money in the, in the bank account. The reason they have money in the bank account is because they spend it all on bills. Right. Number one, rent and food. And the rest of them we got away with, you know, my mom right. used to clean homes. So luckily enough, some of the folks used to give her uh, uh, hand-me-down clothes. And so we had clothes, you know, but oftentimes I think, I, I mean, when, when you think and look at uh, uh, people who are poor, and I was, so I'll talk about it, you don't have- you don't have that ability to go to a bank because oftentimes most of them are only spent right away. Right. And you know, who's going to take two to three buses to get to a bank in, in some out. cases. So what we're wanting to do is get people uh, on, on, a, on, a, um, on their way to, to save money, uh, build credit, uh, and ultimately achieve that American dream. Mm -hmm. Well done. Well done. I guess any other bills that you're you're uh, pushing through I'm here, excited actually? about all of them you know, <laughs> I really have you got all all 20 of them up to your limit well I think it's a little bit less but <laughs> 18, uh, yeah the food yeah. assistance I'm extremely excited about too uh -huh. I mean you know I, I, I don't want to miss one that we're all working on with the with all our uh, all our friends out there but uh excited about that Expe excited about the possibility to reinstate uh, uh visits uh for people who are uh, incarcerated uh right now the visits are on weekends and we're trying to say four days a week um, and, and this is just, this is just a bill that brings dignity to somebody, mm -hmm. uh, who is incarcerated because even if you were to do it two days a week and it's on the weekends, I don't agree with that, but let's say you're the average, you know, the, the person out and listening to this and you right. say, well, that sounds right to me. I mean, who has a Monday through Friday schedule? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like yeah, everyone I mean, has different gotta, schedules. Why not? Go doesn't make Wednesday sense at all. Tuesday? Especially doesn't during COVID now that right? we all have time. Right? Seriously. <laughs> Right. I mean, especially if, you know, in, in most cases, if you have to take a couple of buses or, or make a drive out, it's not like you, you know, press a button and say, hey, I want the closest place next to where, you know, but these are yeah. real challenges. And when you take a look at uh, oftentimes communities of color and the over incarceration that we have had, and now you have little kids who can't see their parents or parents can't see the little kids. I mean, these have devastating impacts on our, our community. So we're working on, on that. I'm working with uh, 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 Diego Gascon in L.A. to remove. Uh, the potential for uh, crimes that occurred under the age of 18. Uh, so they won't be counted against the third strike. And it makes no sense. It, it really right. doesn't make any sense when you take a look at the way the laws are written. Um, a minor under the age of 18 is never convicted but adjudicated and never by a jury or their peers like an adult. Yet that adjudication may or may not count uh, towards a third strike. So, wow. I, I mean, it makes no sense that a kid can't go to prom, yet we can use that action to, to lock them up for the rest of their life makes zero sense. I, I mean, some of these things just don't make right. sense. And there's already, you know, a hundred different enhancements in the books that a judge can use. You don't need that one. I mean, that locks up a kid for life. For I life. mean, wow. I mean, you know, I don't know, you run out of a place, you know, knock down a cell phone and that counts. I mean, come on, right. it makes no sense, you know? And, and it's not apples to apples. And the, and the juvenile system is supposed to be rehabilitative. It is not supposed to be uh, punitive. Mm. Even for those naysayers who are saying, well, no, the kid did a crime. He should pay the time. You know, First of all, BS on, on, on that sort of tough on crime. We knew that it didn't work, right? right. I mean, and, and second of all, it's just not apples to apples. So we're really excited about a lot of the work that we're doing. We spend hours on it. But, yeah. but, uh, but you know, a lot of folks like to say, you know, we can't wait to get back to the norm. Right. And you know, for a lot of us, uh, we're taking a look around and say, well, the norm wasn't working uh, for the majority of people, certainly not the communities that I represent. So I don't want to get back to the norm. Right. I think we want to do a little bit better, a lot better uh, than the norm. We want to do a lot better than the norm because that wasn't working for a lot of people. Try talking to parents who work two jobs, um, both. Try talking to, to kids who, had, who were sitting at home uh, by themselves uh, because their parents are at work. Try talking to that same family who couldn't make rent. 
groceries on the table. I mean, it should only take one job. <laughs> right. It's, it's amazing. So we don't yeah. want to get back to the norm. <laughs> COVID has, has like turned our lives upside down. Now we've kind of realized that maybe what we were doing before wasn't wasn't the best or wasn't, wasn't working for ninety nine percent of the people. <laughs> right. And so now it's kind of nice to have this kind of refresh start, kind of see what we can do to well, we gotta make it better. Make it better. We yeah. gotta make it better. Amen. Well, you're on a hell of a start Thanks. this year. You're a busy guy and the eighty fifty four is <laughs> is definitely uh well represented there. So yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and taking some time. And uh, if some of our listeners want to follow you on social media or kind of see what you're doing, how can we uh, uh, see where you're at? Sure. So uh, Facebook, it's just Miguel Santiago. Uh, on uh, social media, it's at uh, Santiago AD 53. Okay. Well, go check them out. And, check uh, it thank out. You, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank and, you. Uh, best of luck in these uh, next few months. And bed, hope, po- bed, hold hope on you get that money. Bed. Ooh, there you go. Mess it up again, right? Best podcaster ever. <laughs> You. (laughs) Hashtag. (laughs) All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks.